So Psalm 105, if you have your Bible, um, and I'm just going to read the first six verses of that. And I wrote a whole load of things earlier just as I was reflecting on this psalm, and they're, they're not maybe in as ordered as uh, sometimes my thoughts are. For some reason, I've just sort of allowed my meditations to be put in the page, and, and, uh, but hopefully there'll be, there'll be some semblance of order in this. Um, but let me read the first six verses of Psalm 105, and then we will think about this, and this will help to lead us into a time of sharing and prayer, hopefully. So Psalm 105, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually remember the wondrous works that he has done his miracles and the judgments he uttered O offspring of abraham his servant children of jacob his chosen ones i'll end the reading there and i just want us to, to sort of fix our attention on these opening six verses in these first six verses the psalmist here exhorts us to do 10 things as part of our worship and enjoyment of God. If you just cast your eye down it in verse 1, first, we're exhorted to give thanks to the Lord. Second, to call upon his name. Third, to make known his deeds among the peoples. Fourth thing then comes at the start of verse two, where to sing to him, sing praises to him. Fifth thing in verse two also, we're to tell of all his wondrous works. Sixth thing in verse three, we're to glory in his holy name. Seventh, let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We're to rejoice in the Lord. Where did I get to? Eighth thing in verse four. We're to seek the Lord and his strength. Ninth, we're to seek his presence continually. And then the tenth thing comes in verses five and six. We're to remember the wondrous works he has done. So amazing that the, 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 the psalm opens like a fountain just gushing forth, telling us of what our worship and enjoyment of God should consist in. And there is so much we could think about if we were to really unpack these 10 different aspects of Christian worship. It's like holding a diamond up and seeing all these different faces. These 10 aspects of Christian worship could just all be unpacked by themselves. But I just want to focus on the two instructions we're given in verse 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. I read this psalm just a few mornings ago, and that line, seek his presence continually, just really stood out to me. And so I wanted that to be the theme of our meditation this evening. This fourth verse gives us an exhortation and a reminder that can totally transform your prayer life. This verse essentially tells us that we are to always seek a real encounter with God when we pray. Something we must always guard against when we pray is just going through the motions in prayer. Now, there are times when you can be praying and you're really engaged yes. with God. You really experience the living God. You sense deep in your soul that you're meeting with God. There are other times where we can be just going through the motions in prayer and we're, conscious of it and we're struggling a bit, but we press on because we want to be disciplined. But then there are other times when we are going through the motions in prayer and we're not conscious of it. And perhaps that can go on for a certain amount of time. The exhortation of verse four tells us that we should always be driving in 
towards a real encounter with God. A real encounter with God. We are to seek his presence continually. Now, you might say, well, is that not what we always do automatically when we pray? And I would say not necessarily. We can depersonalize prayer. How might we do that? Well, we might have such structures and patterns in prayer that we just do it kind of automatically. I am so used to the ACTS pattern, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, that sometimes I can find myself just morning after morning in my place of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, working through my prayer list. And then I need to almost stop myself for a moment and think, hang on, have I actually sought to be in the presence of God? Have I acknowledged in this moment that I am meeting with the living God through Jesus? And almost sometimes I catch myself uh, needing, uh, going through the motions and needing to stop for a moment to just remember that I am to seek God's presence continually as I meet with him. Now, we have to ask, <laughs> what does it mean to seek the Lord then? And what does it mean to seek his strength? And what does it mean to seek his presence continually? Well, I asked myself as I was reflecting on this earlier, what does it mean to seek anything? Over the past uh, 10 days or so, with extra time with the kids, we've spent a lot of time playing games like hide and seek. And uh, this is not a perfect illustration because God does not hide from us um, as our children hide in just the same way in a game like hide and seek. But when you're seeking the kids, you're looking for them. When you're on a busy beach and you're seeking a place to set your seats, you're seeking it out. It means to look for something or someone. And so when we're invited in this passage to seek the Lord, it means look for God. I think that's so simple and yet so instructive. When I'm reading a psalm like Psalm 23, for example, I'm to look for God. The Lord is my shepherd, and I want to know God as my shepherd. And to not just know him and think of him as a shepherd, but experience him as a shepherd. I've been sitting in my study today looking out at that beautiful day most of the day, and there is a world of difference between looking at the sun shining from sitting in my study and going out and standing directly in the sunbeams as they shine down upon me. It's one thing to look at God from a distance and analyze and think and speculate and, and understand him theologically. It's another thing to actually experience and stand and bask in the goodness of God. So I'm saying, and we'll maybe discuss this in a wee minute, it's one thing to know God is my shepherd. It's another to experience God as my shepherd. So we'll think about that uh, in a few moments. But what does it mean to seek the Lord? We are to look for him. We look for him as we pray. We want to begin in prayer and say, Lord, I want to meet with you. I want to read my Bible to experience and know you more. I want to encounter you. I want to seek your strength and the strength that comes from you, and I want to seek your presence. Now we'll think again about what that means uh, in a little moment. A.W. Tozer has uh, said this very helpfully, to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. See, when we come to Christ, we have, our eyes are opened, we see uh, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have found God. But this starts the journey of getting to know him and experience his greatness and love in our day-to-day -day lives. There's a lovely hymn by St. Bernard. We taste thee, O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. We drink of thee, the fountainhead, and thirst our souls from thee to fill. So if you pick up on that, it's we're feeding on you, Lord, but we long to feed on you more. We're drinking from you as a fountain, but we, it makes us thirst for you all the more. So to feed and to drink on the presence of the Lord just satisfies whilst creating a greater appetite. It's quite a, a paradox. So we are to 
seek the Lord. That means to look for him, to read our Bible, not just to read through it, but to read it in every text, Old Testament, New Testament, whether we're in the Psalms or whether we're in apocalyptic literature, whether we're in Proverbs and wisdom literature, we'd always be asking, what do I see of God? What does this teach me about the character of God, the works of God? How does this lead me on a trajectory to Jesus? We're to look for him to seek God. But we're not just to seek to grow in our mental knowledge of God, as I said, we're to seek to understand and know him more in our hearts. Jesus said in John 17, 3, that eternal life is to know God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. And to know God there, he doesn't just mean know him academically, he means to know experientially as well. To, to, to have an understanding of God in the mind that works its way down to open the eyes of the heart so that, and maybe we can discuss this again afterwards, we actually don't just know theoretically that God is our Father, but we in some way experience deep in our souls or our affections or our feelings. That's maybe too weak. We experience something of the Holy Spirit testifying with our spirits that we are children of God. So, just as I said that there's one, one way for me to look out at the sun here and say, wow, isn't the sunshine beautiful? And that's different from me actually standing in the beams of the sun myself. It's one thing to know God in some way as a shepherd and actually to experience his presence as a shepherd. It might be helpful for you to think of um, verse four in this way. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. The Hebrew word for presence there is face. Seek his face continually. And I think certain other translations, um, like the NIV, for example, put in there, seek his face continually. To seek God's face in the Bible continually means to seek his smile his blessing, to know that all is well as I stand before God, that he has no enmity towards me, that he has no wrath towards me, but that instead, as I seek his smile, his face, his, 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 his blessing, um, that I know all is well deep within my soul. And if we're going to seek the Lord in prayer, and seek his strength, the refreshment and strength that comes from knowing God's presence in our lives, then I think we need to continually walk through and preach the gospel to ourselves. I find it so helpful to remember each day as I'm sealed with guilt again over my poor life, to remember a passage like Romans 5 that reminds me there's therefore, or Romans 8 that reminds me there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or Romans 5, that because of what Christ has done, we have peace with God. I love in the morning, I love at night, put my head down on the pillow and saying, Lord, thank you that tonight as I go to sleep, I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. All is well between me and God because of Jesus. So to seek his presence is to know the smile of his face, to know that all is well, that this father loves me, that this uh, shepherd cares for me, and that I don't just know that in a distant way, but I experience it. I'm seeking it. I'm saying, Lord, I want to seek your presence now in prayer. I, I want to stand here and have a sense that I am in the presence of my father who loves me and that uh, the, the shepherd who cares for me. So, Here's where this makes people a bit nervous. <laughs> I think to seek God's presence involves a biblically governed, faith-filled imagination that actually is a reality. Now, I need to say that again. <laughs> I believe that to seek the Lord's presence in prayer to do that, we need to cultivate a biblically governed, faith-filled imagination 
that actually is a reality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I often have used the, the um, uh, example of uh, my spiritual life being like a garden. You've probably heard me say that before. I like to think as I meet with the Lord um, of my whole spiritual life um, like a garden. Where, where do I get that from? Well, I don't just dream that up out of nowhere. This is a biblically governed um, picture. John 15, for example, um, where Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches and my father is the gardener. So I like to have a biblically governed metaphor. And then I literally will have a faith-filled imagination. So for example, elsewhere, I think of Isaiah 6 and the vision that Isaiah received before the throne of God, where he had the image, the, the uh, vision of God being high and lifted up and the train of his robe filling the temple. In prayer, I like to, if you, if you think I'm crazy in this, don't be afraid to push back when we're discussing it. I like to imagine that I am before the throne of grace. So I bow my head, I close my eyes, and I imagine before the throne, uh, it's like Isaiah's vision, before the throne of grace. And yet I'm in my garden as well. So I'll think of, of myself in a garden. And I imagine that I'm meeting God in uh, before the throne of grace. I'm, I'm not in my kitchen anymore, though I am in my kitchen or in my study. I'm before the throne of grace. And I'm really there because this is receiving and embracing this by faith. It, 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 we walk by faith, not by sight. So as I pray, it's not just that this is not a reality. I, I, I'm before the throne of grace. And so... The biblically governed, faith-filled imagination is a reality. Do you follow me there? <laughs> I'll think of my sin struggles being like a garden that's been poorly kept. There's weeds in the garden. And I'll look at that and say, Lord, what are the weeds that need, we need to work on today? Selfishness is growing up or uh, fear of man is growing out of control, Lord. Can you help me now attack this today? I'll imagine that there's a nice water feature in the garden. And I, I sort of think, is it growing with algae and all green and dirty, Lord? Or is it pure? You know, can we get to work on cleaning it? And so I hope this doesn't sound too hippie-ish and crazy. But using biblical pictures to govern a faith-filled imagination, that is a reality. I really believe that is how in my own life I have learn to seek God's presence so that I'm not just going through the motions in prayer, but I'm really before the throne of grace. I'm really approaching on the basis of the merits of Christ and really experiencing the love and fellowship of God because I am with him in that moment, not just using an imagination that runs wild and goes crazy. That's often what, what when you, you lose the scriptural anchors, um, everything just gets chaotic and, and over charismatic and speculative. But where our faith filled imagination is anchored in scripture, I, I think that faith filled, biblically governed imagination is a reality. We actually are meeting with God and experiencing his presence without just dreaming it up or psychologically trying to imagine things. So, that's a bit of a <laughs> that's a bit of a, a a meandering series of thoughts there, but just getting back to the point of verse four. Our driving goal in prayer, and when we are meeting with God devotionally, is that we should be seeking a real encounter with God, seeking the Lord, seeking the strength that comes from Him, and seeking His presence. I don't know what else that means other than seeking to experience in a real way that as we pray, we are meeting with the living God, knowing his love, knowing his fatherhood, knowing his holiness. And I'm saying that one of the ways in my own life I have experienced that in, in a very real way at times, not always, is having a biblically governed faith-filled imagination that is a reality. So I'm going to end there because hopefully this will um, set up some questions. 
And uh, for those that are listening to the recording, uh, if you have any questions and you want to follow up, then do just write to me or put it in the Stay Connected group and I'll try to clarify some things.